Um, some days, honestly, I wonder whether the world can change. Um, we all kind of do sometimes, right? Then I remember that when I was a kid, I had to get off of the couch to change the channels on our television growing up. I'm pretty sure that's why my parents had kids, is because they wanted a remote control, and I was that remote control. Um, back in the day, uh, for all of you young whippersnappers out there, um, back in the day, we had telephones in our house that were like on the wall, um, believe it or not. And when someone would call you, you had no idea who was calling you until you picked up the phone and answered it. It was just a crapshoot every time <laughs> it was going to be on the other line. Um, and twice a year, the phone company would come by with this huge book and bring it to your house, and it had everyone in the whole town's phone number in it. You could just open it up and call anyone in the entire city. It was crazy, and some of us teenagers did it. Um, not always with benevolent purposes, too, and they just answered the phone because they had no idea who was calling them, and it was me. <laughs> it all seemed very normal back then. Um, luckily, of course, technology has advanced, um, and so did our respect for privacy and each other. The world, as we look back, has indeed changed. We laugh about some of these things, but the, the question of whether the world can change or not is a real one. Because it seems like there is so much work to do in our world, so much change to happen. And in some days, it seems like we are running in place, if not sliding backwards. Uh, can we change? Can our world be different? Can it change? When the persistent sins of, of racism and prejudice, of self-centeredness and superficiality, when these remain with us for so long, we wonder about that. On days that we see, as, as many of you did yesterday, we see emboldened young men harassing a Native American veteran during his peaceful protest. We wonder whether change is even within our abilities, whether the transformation and the liberation that God dreams for us, that we dream for our world is possible. And those are real questions. That is a real question. It's sincere. But they're questions that reinforce the importance of what we're celebrating this weekend. Of, uh, of each year as we gather around the memory and the message and the mission of the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., pastor and prophet and papa, <laughs> to remember through his witness and example, to remember that things can change and that it is real people who change them. Real women and men gathering around God's dream and God's spirit, working with each other and for each other and for people we do not even know for what is right, that that really makes a difference. And though it may seem small and iterative in the moment, as we look back over the years, we can see the change. We can look back past telephones and remote controls. We can also look back through segregation and suffrage and sit-ins and stonewall. And though clearly we have so far yet to go, we recognize that we have come so far that the world can change, that we can change. And we've seen it, some of us, in our lifetimes in profound ways. And so we see the wisdom in Dr. King's words of encouragement to us that the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends toward justice. And these words that he spoke at the Montgomery bus boycotts are beautiful and true. But the real wisdom is his example that he lived every day, that the arc does not bend by apathy and complacency. But that in every time and place, people of goodwill are called to grab hold of that moral arc and bend it down a little further along its course. And that is our work in our time. And this calls us, I think especially as people of faith, because Dr. King would say that this arc is being bent by and bending toward the heart of God, a God that calls all people beloved in every tribe and nation and culture and background. The arc bends toward the heart of a God who calls us all beloved, and invites us to begin to create and to be in and live in the reality of a beloved community with love at its center, inviting us to be a part, to grab hold of that ark and to get to work, but to remember every step of the way that things can and will 
change and that we are called to be a part of changing them and to be changed ourselves. That is our work in our time. So my son Hudson came home from school on Friday with a drawing of Dr. King that he did um, in a little booklet, which is way better than the macaroni and glue that he usually comes home with. The booklet that he came home with uh, was called Before and After Dr. King. And it's great because it beautifully outlines some of the ways that the world is different because of Dr. King's life. Um, it talks about water fountains and integrated schools and, and buses and more. Uh, real change, real life change. But of course, uh, as I look through that, I, I noticed some of the things that Dr. King dreamed and worked for that were not listed as fully changed yet. Income inequality, systemic prejudice, brutality and state violence, opportunity in education, equity, no matter your zip code or skin color. And the tasks that he worked for that remain fall to us in our time. But even still, as we look over that, the world is so different before and after. And for that, we praise God and we celebrate, rightly, Dr. King's legacy, and we tell the story of real change in our time. So this week, when I asked my friend Paige Dixon, uh, as we celebrate MLK um, this weekend, what do you want to make sure that your church talks about this weekend? And she said that people can really make a difference, that things can really change when we work courageously and selflessly to change them, and that all of us are called to be about that work. That's the inspiration of Dr. King she said. And so as I reflected on her words and the challenge of them in my own life and the challenge of her example as someone who's at work for those very things, uh, I began to imagine my magazine <laughs> with a different color, cover, the world before and after Jonathan. What would that magazine even begin to say? Um, after Jonathan, there was a lot less ice cream in the world, um, a lot more dad jokes in the world, something like that. But, but in my time, how is God calling me to grab that ark and bend it? What's my before and after in this world, in my neighborhood, in my workplace, in my family, in my city, in my country, within the larger church? What is my work to do, that work for all people in the way of Dr. King? Or for all of us together, for your own magazine, or for the magazine of this community, you know, what, what would it say, Denton, <laughs> before and after open worship? What, was, what would be our work along that arc of justice? And that imagining this as this big before and after may seem an impossible ask, but Dr. King and the women and the men of the civil rights movement are testimony that the world can change through the simple act of doing what is right. That in that choice, there is a before and an after. And as Dr. King reminds us, the time is always right to do what is right. And so as Paige said, today, let us be inspired. Let us recommit to doing what is right in ways small and big and believing in the change that God is working in our world. In some ways, small and big, in every relationship and conversation and encounter, in every step of our journey, in every stack, act of standing for justice, we're choosing creative altruism in our world. Let our lives bend toward justice, toward love. Let our lives bend toward each other and bend toward the heart of God. And we can do this, take heart, even if our steps are stumbling and naive along the way, when we do them in great humility and love, as we keep working for change, Dr. King reminds us that it is possible for us all to be about this work. He says, if you can't fly, run. If you can't run, walk. If you can't walk, crawl. But by all means, keep moving forward. So over the last few years, I've been thinking about how to keep moving forward uh, for myself, for my family, for us here at Open, how we might be a part of that change. And I've learned so much through listening and sitting with that question with you. As I've contemplated this, like many of you, uh, I've, I've turned often to Dr. King and to the women and the men of the civil rights era because it was a time in our history when people of faith and people in the church were part of changing the world. Not all churches, or even most, of course, but the courageous, compassionate, creative, Christ-like churches. 
So the vision of Dr. King was rooted in holistic transformation of spirits. He was a pastor after all. Um, even more than a legal remedy, although that was a real goal of his work and a real change in our world, the vision toward which he saw change was bending was so much more. It was a God vision of what he and, and many before him called the creation of the beloved community, a community with love at its center where all are regarded as beloved children of God, of sacred worth and profound purpose. It's a community not of uniformity, but of unity and love and diversity in life. And that is the vision of Dr. King, but more importantly, it was the vision that Jesus laid out as he proclaimed the kingdom or the community of God in our world. And the early church glimpsed this through the life of Christ and those of the followers. They glimpsed this beloved community and they declared the words that we spoke out today. There is no longer Jew or Greek, no longer slave or free. There's no longer male or female for all of you, all of us are one in Christ Jesus, called to be and to live in and to create the beloved community. So Dr. King wrote of, of this larger purpose of his work. He said this about that community creating work. Desegregation will break down legal barriers and bring men, you see, even had work to do there, bring men and women and all of us together physically. Uh, but something must happen so as to touch the hearts and souls of humanity, that they will come together, not because the law says it, but because it is natural and right. The end is reconciliation. The end is redemption. The end is the creation of the beloved community. More than anything, it is about this soul and heart transformation that God is working with us and among us all. And coming together is especially hard today because it seems like maybe even more so than in the 1950s and 60s, we are divided today by, by age and wrath race and class and gender and nationality and orientation and politics and, and that some of us listen to Kanye and some of us listen to Enrique and some of us listen to Country and, <laughs> and all of us listen to Beyonce so we can have that as our unity, of course. But the work amidst all of that diversity is to create community together with love at its center. And in those places of beloved community, those places are where we see and experience soul change, where life flourishes and divisions fall. And I love and I, I praise our God of love for the ways that we've seen it happen in this space in small ways and in our lives together. And for the ways that it has happened as we step out into the larger community and we let Christ's love send us and bend us toward each other. So the work of building this beloved community is why for Dr. King and for Jesus, nonviolence was the only path. Because at the end was the creation of a community with love at its heart. And so love was the means. How we get there matters because the means create the ends. Love creates the beloved community. And so as we step out, we step out with our one ethic to be, to love our neighbor as we love ourselves. And so how can we be about that work of creating beloved community in our time? So Dr. King said that there were three things that he wanted to characterize the work that he was doing through the civil rights movement to foster and create the beloved community. And uh, like a pastor, all of those three characteristics started with the letter C, because that's just sort of how we roll in this game. He was a preacher after all. So here are his words, these three characteristics. Um, courage, compassion, and creativity were to be the way that this work is done in the world. And I love that. Courage, the heart to act, rooted in compassion and love for all people, especially those who are vulnerable and maybe those who consider themselves our enemies in the way of Christ, with action that is creative in the face of obstacles, helping create what is not yet creating, making peace and community and reconciliation. May we exhibit those three characteristics in such a time as this. So there's a lot to say here, 
But I want, to say, I want to share just three simple ways that I think God might be calling us anew to courage and compassion and creativity in our time as we seek to be community building, reconciling, arc bending, change makers together. And so the first is this, um, to build the beloved community, may we have the courage to make others safe. Our God, as we talked about last week, is fiercely protective of the vulnerable takes pride in calling God's self father to the fatherless, defender of the vulnerable, protector of the widow and the orphan, those who represented the most vulnerable in the culture of the day. God insists that we follow suit. Psalm 82 verses 3 and 4 is clear in this, this command to us, give justice to the weak and the orphan, maintain the right of the lowly and the destitute, rescue the weak and the needy, deliver them from the hand of the wicked. And there are so many in our world who feel weak and vulnerable right now, across all of the lines, vulnerable because of how they were born or where they were born, because of their identity or their religion, maybe they're they're Hindu or Muslim, Mormon or Christian or Jew, because of the language that they speak or their immigration status, the color of their skin, their disability, because they're veterans or, or first responders, and on and on, there is great vulnerability in our time. And as we go, we can have the courage to listen to that cry of vulnerability and to do in our power something about it. In our words and in our language, in our community here, we need to speak clearly and speak up and say that we reject racism and bigotry and violence, hatred and malice and sexism and misogyny and division because of differing views. We may disagree with each other, but we do not denigrate because our God is love, and we believe in the separation of church and hate. We seek to live it out in everything that we do. And it's not just that we don't partake in these conversations, but we do, as our baptismal vows in the United Methodist Church say, we oppose the forces of evil, injustice, and oppression in whatever forms they present themselves. Because evil, as William Weaver said, depends on good people being quiet. And so we'll speak up. And we'll step in when we see and we hear that happening wherever we go. With courage, we will shut down unwholesome talk and unwholesome Facebook threads. We'll defend the vulnerable. We'll seek justice and we'll seek just institutions. And it may take courage, but our God rejoices when we make the vulnerable safe because that's who God is. So uh, Lindsay and I love our two kiddos, Grace and Hudson. Um, There they are. But not every moment at our house, believe it or not, is quite as serene and happy as this (laughs) photo here. We just don't take photos of those meltdown moments. But something beautiful has begun happening in our household in the midst of of meltdown. Uh, When Grace, our young daughter, is upset or hurt, sometimes our son Hudson will step in. He'll come to her, he'll hug her, and he'll talk to her, and he'll reassure her. And in her fear and hurt, Hudson will say, it's okay, baby Grace, I'm right here with you. In those moments, nothing makes this father prouder. And in his courage, he is creating community and passing it on because grace has started doing the same thing to him as well, just with less words and more hugs. There are people in our world who need that very response from us, who need in the midst of their vulnerability to hear you, to hear the church say, it's okay, we're right here with you. We hear you, and we'll help you be heard. We are for you. We are with you. And when we do, on behalf of the vulnerable especially, nothing makes our God, protector of the vulnerable, prouder as we make community by courageously making others safe. So as we go, may we also have the compassion to make others welcome. So we begin open um, with a simple welcome. We say, all are welcome here. God's love is here for you, and so are we. It's a powerful welcome for us to extend and to live into, but it is exactly who our God is and so who we try to be in response, because it's not just a good phrase. It is the good news of our God. We believe that God is at work in every life, open always to us with welcome no matter what. And so we welcome all because we were all welcomed in that same way. 
This is what Paul writes in Romans chapter 15, verse 7. Therefore, welcome one another as Christ has welcomed you for a greater purpose, for the glory of God. Christ welcomed us just as we are, right where we are on our journey with all our stuff. We were welcomed. But more than just that, Christ saw us as worthy of love. We were, wel- we were listened to and valued. With compassion, we were welcomed and we were affirmed as beloved children of God. And so it's, it's that welcome and love that sits at the heart of the beloved community. And we are called to extend it to others always. To others to listen and to learn particularly from those that are different than us without feeling the need to speak or defend or to be right, but to simply listen in humility that we might learn and love and change. May we have the same compassion to listen and love and affirm and make welcome as Christ welcomed us for the sake of beloved community. Finally, this. Amidst courage and compassion, may we have the creativity to make friends. Um, now this is, this is not like just Barney the Purple Dinosaur friendship stuff that we're talking about here. As I've said before, here at Open, we believe that friendship is one of the most powerful, transformative relational forces in the world. It is the end of reconciliation and community building as we exchange hostility and division for a relationship of friendship and mutuality. So here's why. Um, Think of your friends in your life. Um, Think of those crazy ones that you hang out with, that you love deeply. Friendship says, in those relationships, we are two different people, and we're so glad for it. We listen to each other. We learn from each other. We want the best for each other as friends. We lay down our lives even for each other without the expectation that we will ever be the same in thought, or in life. We're friends. And when we build those kinds of friendships, especially improbable friendships across improbable barriers, it builds bridges and reconciles and makes peace and makes community. That act of friendship affirms and empowers each other. And in that, friendship can heal and transform and create community and create change. So, When I think of that kind of powerful friendship, I think of a story that I have fallen in love with, um, a story of how the world can change, because it's the story of how our city of Denton changed. And you may have heard me refer to this story before. It's the story of the integration of Denton High School in the town of Denton in the 1960s, in the time of Martin Luther King. But before the Civil Rights Bill was passed, leaders and educators in Denton courageously and compassionately led the way in doing what was right in breaking down the color barrier in our schools. Uh, The state champion Denton High School Bronco football team that you see in this picture is a microcosm of that experience because they broke down barriers and united together and they succeeded. The football team gets a lot of credit in this story usually, um, but the engine of reconciliation, the beginning of that story, did not happen on the gridiron. It happened like it does so often with some of the women in town. The community making, courage and creativity began with the moms of some of the students. Mothers of students who were in school newly together, who saw the challenges of life together ahead, the state of the world, who saw what should be, but was not yet. And they got together across barriers and boundaries to make each other safe, to make welcome, and to make friends. So they called their group the Denton Christian Women's Interracial Fellowship. And every one of those words were important. Denton Christian Women's Interracial Fellowship or friendship. And I love that. Courageous, creative women from right here in our community and right here in our church. You may not know it, but you might pass by some of them as you walk down the halls. So once a month, they would meet each other in one another's homes as friends. And one of the participants, Dorothy Dorothy Atkins, said this. She said, I don't think any of us thought of it as a social movement. We were just interested in getting to be friends because we were finding a whole new group of people from different backgrounds and situations. Our kids were going to school together, and we were just interested in how each faced their own problems. 
We got to know each other as friends, and we've been friends ever since. Well, they didn't mean for it to become a social movement, but when they got to know each other, as they cared about each other, with courage and compassion and creativity, they began to do what they could do to support each other on this life, to pray on each other's behalf and to pray with their feet and their actions for each other as well. They went into the city and advocated with businesses and home associations for um, uh, the end of discrimination by race and nationality and religion. They stood up in city council, these moms did, for justice and what is right, and they shaped their kids to do the same, and this group of friends shaped our community. They built bridges, and they tore down barriers all together in their friendship. They made friends. They made transformation. They made beloved community, and they changed our city and helped make it what it is becoming today. They were for each other. They were for their friends, And in a way, they were for us all as they bent that ark in their time and in their place because they created a glimpse of beloved community and they created change through courageous, compassionate, creative friendship. And so for us, here is open in our time. The need for that same creative friendship is still here. We need in our world and in our city a new engine of transformation and reconciliation We need new courage, new compassion, new creativity. We need new friendships. We need new people to go and and sit with students and listen, to sit with other moms and other dads, to sit in the living rooms and the dorm rooms of those across divides, to go to the mosque, to go to the iglesia, and to go to be creative, to put our feet underneath each other's kitchen tables and begin to make peace and make change and make community with our lives, with courage and compassion and creativity to make friends and see what God's love can do in our generation, what our before and after will be. So the work, the before and after of Dr. King is not finished. Though he glimpsed it, he has not reached the promised land, but he knows that we will, because the work cannot and will not end, because it is part of that unstoppable, arc-bending, community-creating, world-reconciling, vulnerable, liberating, all-welcoming, beloved work of our God, that we are all invited to join. The women of the Denton Christian Women's Interracial Fellowship took the ark from King and pulled it farther on their course, and others followed after with that same courage and compassion and creativity. But now is our time to be community makers, reconcilers, world changers. We realize and we are grateful that we do not do this in our own strength. We do it with each other, but most importantly, we do it in the power of our God who calls us all beloved children the God who has broken down the walls of hostility and made us one, who rolled away stones that no human could imagine ever being rolled away and things changing, but in those spaces bringing new life and new hope and change where it seemed impossible. And so now, as we gather this weekend to remember the legacy of Dr. King, we also remember the call on us that this is our time. May we love as we've been loved with courage and compassion and creativity for the beloved community, for the work of God and the transformation of the world. Let's pray together. Great God of love, of safety, of welcome, of friendship, out of whose mind came all of this diverse and beautiful universe. Thank you. Help us to seek that which is high and noble and good. Help us to work with renewed vigor for a world of peace and equality and siblinghood that transcends race, color, gender, nationality. God, we thank you for the inspiration of Jesus. May we love you with all our hearts and souls and minds and love our neighbor as we love ourselves. And God, we thank you for this community, this beloved place where we're beginning to glimpse your work, founded on your message, 
that challenges us to do more than to sing and to pray, but to go out and work as though the very answer to our prayers depended upon us and not solely on you. So help us to realize, God, that all humanity was created to shine like stars in a beloved community of perfect peace. Help us to walk together, pray together, sing together, and live together until that day when all God's children rejoice in one common band in the beloved community, in the reign and life and love of our God of love, now and forever. We pray this. We pray in gratitude for Dr. King. Amen.